All right, welcome everyone to the second um, of our second webinar of our webinar series on the CRA implementation. Um, today, uh, so why are we doing this uh, uh, series? Well, we realized um, in the last couple of weeks that we really wanted to be able to bring the community up to speed uh, on understanding not only the CRA, but also how it's going to be implemented um better understand the impact on open source and essentially align ourselves uh to be able to move forward um today um so there are four uh, uh topics in the series uh last week we had a first topic uh ran by enzo on how to read the cra uh today we're going to be looking at an introduction like a high level introduction to the cra and then identifying the relevant obligations for the open source community and then we'll have a follow-up session next week on standards and lastly on all of the additional parts of um the implementation the guidelines attestations etc um and yeah, I don't want to take more of your time today. Uh, we're going to focus, as I was just saying, on identifying the relevant obligations for the open source community. And for this session today, I'm incredibly happy to be able to uh, introduce our guest, Benjamin Bogo, who is the head of sector for product security and certification policy at the European Commission. Uh, Benjamin, uh, welcome. Hi, everyone. So let me just stop sharing my slides and you should be able uh, to share your deck, Benjamin. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Okay, just give me one second. Sure, absolutely. Um, and folks in the audience, I see that the chat, I see some of you saying hi in the chat, so you should all be able to use the chat. Um, and ask questions uh, using uh, Zoom's Q&A tool, um, which um, we will answer uh, towards the end of this call. Great, so can you see my slides? Yes, absolutely. Okay, perfect. So thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really happy to be here. I'm super excited about your um, standardization initiative. Curious to see um, how far it will go. I think it's a, a really interesting initiative. And yeah, I mean, so I will just present to you a little bit um, at a high level what the CRA is all about. I mean, there are basically two parts of this presentation. I will first maybe give a general overview of what the CRA is. So not open source specific, just like a general overview. And then in the second half of the presentation, I would really focus on the most important open source elements of, of the text. And then I will close by, I mean, by, by letting you know a little bit about the timeline that we have. So um, I, I, say, I think probably for some, of you, for, for some of you, this may be a little bit repetitive because you've probably all already seen some CRA um, presentations. So I apologize to those, but I hope that there are some people to who this will still be interesting. So, I mean, what is the CRA about? I think you all know it, right? Um, I know there are also some Swiss, Swiss, Swiss people in the audience, so they may appreciate uh, this, this slide. Uh, I mean, we are talking, of course, about products with digital elements with vulnerabilities. So on the left-hand side, you have one of those products, right? A hardware or software product. And uh, the cheese holes, they represent the vulnerabilities. And of course, the purpose of the CRA is to help manufacturers, to incentivize manufacturers so that they take uh, the cybersecurity of their products more seriously and uh, address the security holes in their products. So here are the main elements of the law. I mean, we're talking about cybersecurity rules for the placing on the market of hardware and software products. Um, these are basically uh, security by design rules. Um, the obligations in the CRA, they are for different types of economic actors. Uh, first and foremost, of course, for the manufacturers, I mean, normally they are called vendors, but in our context in product legislation, in EU product legislation, these, these entities are called manufacturers. Um, they, of course, have to bear the brunt of the obligations. Then there are also the distributors and the importers. So uh, distributors are basically online shops or brick and mortar stores. 
And uh, both distributors and importers, they have some, uh, I would say, um, more paperwork type of obligations as they are not involved in the actual uh, development of the product. Uh, the core elements of the CRA are really the cybersecurity essential requirements. So these essential requirements are the security by design rules. They are um, high level and uh, technology neutral. Uh, that is, of course, done on purpose because the CRA covers a wide range of products that have very that are very different by nature from one, one from the other. And it gives flexibility to the manufacturers to implement the rules in a manner that is appropriate and compatible with the product that they are building. I mean, we are talking really about the cybersecurity 101, right? Ensure the confidentiality of data, the integrity of data, make sure that essential services remain available, um, log security relevant events and so forth. Uh, security by default, right? No more password 1111. Uh, things like that. So we are really talking about uh, the essentials uh, of cybersecurity. Um, these rules, they do not only apply, or these uh, cybersecurity essential requirements, they do not only apply at the time that the product is placed on the market, as is usually the case for other product legislation, but they cover the entire life cycle of a product. And I mean, that is obvious. Uh, cybersecurity is a little bit different from safety, right? And in the cybersecurity world, um, security updates are, of course, uh, of the essence, and this is why we have taken this approach. So basically, once you have placed your compliant product on the market, you will res remain responsible for that product, and you will have to provide security updates when you identify new vulnerabilities. In order to support uh, the manufacturers in their endeavor to be compliant with the CRA, we are going to provide harmonized standards. And when I say we, I actually mean the European standardization organizations. So we are going to send a request to the European standardization organizations to develop those harmonized standards. And these harmonized standards, they translate the high level essential requirements into concrete and actionable technical measures for the type of product that you are building. Um, the CRA consists of different types of conformity assessment. Uh, conformity assessment means checking whether a product is compliant before it is being placed on the market. And these different types of conformity assessments, they depend on the level of risk that is associate, associated with the product. And I will explain that in a bit more detail in a moment. There are also some reporting obligations in the CRA uh, manufacturers. They have to report actively exploited vulnerabilities uh, that they have in their products um, to the national, to, through, the, through a single European, uh, through a single um, reporting platform to the national authorities. And they also have to report um, incidents that can have an impact on the security of the product. And finally, there are some market surveillance elements. So all 27 member states of the EU have to uh, set up their own national market surveillance authorities. And these authorities will be in a position to enforce the rules after a product has been placed on the market. And this enforcement can range from um, issuing fines if necessary to um, asking that a product is withdrawn from the market. Yeah, I mean, I guess you're all familiar with the CE marking. The CE marking basically says that the product that you have is compliant with all applicable product legislation at union level, right? So this has been historically used in the context of safety. You probably know it from your smartphone charger, right? The CE marking basically tells you that this charger is compliant with EU laws and that you will not be electrocuted. And we are now ex essentially extending the framework from safety to security. So the CRA uses the same type of language and the same uh, template as other uh, EU product legislation, but it is of course um, adapted to the world of security. So once the CRA has entered into application, when you see, let's say a laptop and it carries the CE marking, it will mean that this laptop is not only safe, but that it's also secure basically because it is compliant with the Cyber Resilience Act. So which products are we actually talking about? The scope of the CRA is relatively uh, broad. Yeah, I mean, we're covering all hardware and software products, everything that is directly or indirectly connectable. So that is laptops, uh, smart home appliances, computer games, and so forth. But the scope is not only wide, it's also deep, yeah, because we cover the entire supply chain of those products. 
So we don't only cover final products, but also all their components when they are placed on the market as separate products. And the logic behind that deep scope is that many components are considered as um, black boxes, right? I mean, it's difficult for a manufacturer of a final product to check the security of a component. Think of a CPU, right? I mean, it's very difficult to understand the security posture of a CPU or think of a compiled software library, same thing, very difficult for the integrator to understand the security. And hence, uh, these components are considered as separate products and come with their own obligations. Um, when we talk about products, we take a bit more of a holistic approach to products, as the user often doesn't know or probably doesn't care too much if uh, the, the data is processed locally by that product or whether the data is processed somewhere remotely, maybe on the site of the manufacturer or in a cloud data center, right? So basically everything that belongs to the product, whether it's hosted, whether it's run on premise by the user or whether it's executed somewhere else remotely, it all belongs to the product. We've therefore invented this term, term of remote data processing solutions so a product is basically the physical or local elements plus its remote data processing solutions. There are also a few things that uh, we do not cover. Of course, we don't cover non-commercial products, right? Anything that is just done as a hobby is outside the scope. That also goes, of course, for open source. If you do open source just as a hobby and there is no commercial nature to it at all, then you are simply outside the scope of the CRA. We also don't cover standalone services, such as, for instance, standalone software as a service. These are already covered by the NIS2 directive. So, for instance, a, a website, yeah, that which could, in theory, also be considered as a software as a service, would not be covered by the Cyber Resilience Act. That being said, of course, there is this element of uh, remote data processing, which can also, of course, come in the shape of a uh, software as a service, and, and that would then be covered as part of the product. Then we also have a couple of outright exclusions for products that are already covered by other union legislation. And this includes, for instance, motor vehicles and medical devices and uh, marine equipment. Now, um, just to give you an understanding of how the interplay works between um, the manufacturer of a final product and uh, the components that are sourced from the market. So there are basically uh, two scenarios. Um, a manufacturer may either integrate uh, a component that they have developed by themselves, right? And that would then be a component that would not be placed on the market as a separate product, or they would just source a component from the market from another manufacturer and then integrate it into the product. In this uh, concrete example here, we, we have a smartphone, yeah? And uh, the manufacturer of that smartphone integrates a couple of components that they have developed themselves, like here on the on the left hand side, right? In blue, you see the screen and the camera and the operating system and, and the battery. Uh, so these would, I mean, it's a fictitious example, of course, right? But these components here, they would be developed by the manufacturer and just they just go straight into the final product and are part of the conformity assessment of the final product. And then on the right hand side, you see the RAM, the CPU and the network interface. And, and these would be components that the manufacturer sources on the market. So they're placed on the market as separate products. They carry their own CE marking and they're also subject to the, C, to the, to the CRA. And in order to ensure the security of the overall product, the manufacturer has something that we call a due diligence obligation. So whenever you integrate a component from a third party, you have to do due diligence. You have to do your utmost to ensure that this component is secure. And that, of course, depends on the level of risk. I mean, you can never, of course, be 100% certain about the security of a component. It would probably be too much to ask to read every single line of code of every component that you integrate, right? But for instance, I mean, the fact that another component carries the CE marking already tells you a lot about the security of that product. And in more um, demanding uh, risk or security environments, you would, of course, go beyond just checking the CE marking. You would perhaps run your own tests to ensure that the component is really secure. Yeah, and back to the conformity assessment that I mentioned earlier, uh, there are different types of conformity assessment for the vast majority of products uh, that fall in the default category. So these are all the products that are not explicitly listed as important or critical in the annex of the CRA. To all those 
default products self-assessment applies and self-assessment essentially means that the manufacturer has to verify by themselves whether um, the product that they are placing on the market is CRA compliant. And examples of this default category are memory chips, mobile apps, but basically anything that is not explicitly listed. Then the second category are the important products. They are listed in the annex. Examples are operating systems, antivirus, routers, and so forth. And for those products, a more stringent type of conformity assessment applies. At the very least, the manufacturer would need to follow a harmonized standard, or if they do not want to do that, they would need to go to a third party to have the product checked. And for some very important products, it would be exclusively a third party conformity assessment. Then there are also critical products. Um, they are also listed in the annex. And the regime that applies to those products is identical to the one of the important products in the sense that they would need to submit, uh, the manufacturers would need to submit those products to a third party. But there is the possibility that in the future, the commission will require that these products are subjected to a certification scheme under the Cybersecurity Act, which is another piece of EU legislation which provides uh, for certification schemes. The newest certification scheme, and at the moment the only one actually, is the EUCC, the European Union Common Criteria Scheme, which is obviously based on common criteria. So there is a possibility that these products will be subject, for instance, to a common criteria certification in the future. Yeah, and then finally, in the negotiations, an additional category has been introduced, the free and open source software. So if you're a manufacturer, a traditional manufacturer, and you develop your product as a free and open source software, you would also be subject to self-assessment, even if your product would otherwise be considered as important, right? So for instance, if you develop an open operating system and you place it on the market and you monetize that operating system, it would be an important product. But if it's a free and open source software, you would nonetheless be subject to self-assessment. And the logic behind that is simply to say that free and open source software is fully transparent. You do not need a third party to vouch for the security of the product because you as a user, maybe not every single user, but the user community as a whole, they can, of course, check the security of the product by themselves. So now let's move on to the uh, open source parts. Uh, these were now basically all rules that are relevant for manufacturers. So for traditional companies uh, uh, that build products and place them on the market. One additional obligation that these manufacturers have is that when they discover a, um, a vulnerability in a component, uh, in an open source component, that they do something about it. So here in this example, we are back to the smartphone manufacturer, right? On the left hand side, you have the product. On the right hand side, you have an open source component. Yeah, a very simple component in this case that just basically prints the context of an, uh, contents of an, of an array. So, and if I, as a manufacturer, integrate that component, of course, I have the due diligence obligation. So I need to check if there is a vulnerability in that component. And if I do find a vulnerability in the course of the development of my final product, then I have to, I have a legal obligation to inform the, um, the uh, maintainers of that uh, component so that the maintainers can do something about the vulnerability. In addition, if I do integrate that component into my final product and this vulnerability is relevant as a vulnerability for my final product, I also have to patch it, right? Because I am responsible for the security of the product as a whole. No matter where the component comes from, I am responsible for the product as a whole when I place it on the market. So if I do, uh, fix the vulnerability on my end for my product, I would the manufacturer would also have an obligation to provide that fix upstream to the maintainer of the component so that the maintainer of the component can consider integrating that fix upstream basically into the original repository. So and we think that this is a fair sharing of the burden of the responsibility between the manufacturers and the open source development community. So now to the open source uh, more specifically. Um, in the commission proposal that we, that we put forward, um, 
we had already said that open source projects would uh, largely be excluded from the scope. But of course, as you're all aware, there was a lot of confusion. It was not clear what would exactly be excluded. Would open source projects that are not strictly placed on the market, but developed in a broader commercial framework, would they be considered a product or not? So throughout the negotiations, uh, we strive to provide additional clarity. And this clarity, of course, means that now everything has become a little bit more complicated, which is why I'm presenting you this decision tree. But uh, it's not too complicated. And I will just now walk you through the transition uh, through the decision tree and explain to you um, what the obligations for you are. So we start on the top left um, with the first box. So you are you are um, writing code for a free and open source software component, let's say. And the first question that you need to ask yourself, am I in charge of that component? Am I the maintainer of that component? <clears throat> or am I merely contributing to someone else's component? If I'm merely contributing, I am already outside the scope of the Cyber Resilience Act. It will not apply to me. So good news, if you're just con contributing to someone else's component, you do not have to worry about the Cyber Resilience Act. At least you're not responsible for, for the compliance with the CRA. If you are now uh, the, the entity or person that is providing the open source uh, solution to the public, then we move to the, to the right, yeah, uh, to the box in the middle, basically. And now the question is, is this taking place in the course of a commercial activity in the broadest sense? Yeah, I mean, I already explained it before. If it's really just a hobby, again, you're outside the scope. We move to the right-hand side, right? Not in scope. You're not uh, covered by the Cyber Resilience Act. However, is there, if there is a commercial activity in the broad sense, then um, you will be likely covered by the Cyber Resilience Act. And then we move down. Now the question is, in which way am I covered by the Cyber Resilience Act? Am I a traditional manufacturer in the sense that I am placing the component on the market and then I'm directly monetizing that project? Yes, then I am a manufacturer and all the obligations that I explained earlier, uh, they apply to me. You're Then in that case, you're basically a traditional top-down organized company. You place a product on the market, you have, a you have probably a compliance department and so forth. And then the full set of CRA rules, they apply to you. Now, if there is a commercial activity in the broadest sense, but you're not directly monetizing your project, you could potentially be an open source software steward on the right hand side. Yeah. So when, am you, when are you an open source software steward? Yeah, there must be a commercial activity in the widest sense. Yeah, that would, for instance, be the case where a number of manufacturers teams up and they jointly develop a component that they all integrate into their own respective products. Yeah, and then these products are ultimately placed on the market. Then, of course, there is no direct monetization of the component, but there is nonetheless a commercial activity. Yeah, so if that is the case, you could be an open source software steward. Now, and if there is a legal person, such as an open source software foundation that provides uh, support on a sustained basis, um, to this uh, to this component, um, as is, for instance, the case, yeah, with many of the open source uh, software foundations. So then you would be then this foundation would be considered an open source software steward, and a very light uh, touch regime would apply to this uh, steward. If the component is developed collaboratively, let's say, and there is a wider commercial um, dimension, but there is no open source stuff, software steward available, yeah, if it's just a decentralized collaboration without governance structures, again, you would be outside the scope of the CRA, even though there is a wider commercial activity. So this, this flowchart, it is a bit simplified, right? The legal text is a little bit more complicated, but, but I think it gives you a very good understanding and overview of the different types of actors in the CRA, and it helps you determine what type of actor you are. So let's dive a little bit more into the open source software steward. Yeah, let's say you're not a manufacturer, but you are an open source software steward. As I said, the regime that would apply to you would be pretty light touch. Um, you would be basically uh, required to um, develop a uh, cybersecurity policy. Examples of open source software stewards are, as I said, foundations that support specific free and open source software products, but also companies that build free and open source software for their own use, but make it public, right, if they don't monetize it. 
or not-for-profit entities that develop free and open source software. The obligations of the steward are, as I said, have a cybersecurity policy in place that takes into account the specific nature of the open source software steward, because we are aware that not all open source software stewards, not all foundations are the same, right? I mean, they are they can be quite different in the way that they are organized and the responsibilities that they take for the project that they are overseeing. So this is very important. It should take into account the specific nature of the steward. Another obligation is that you have to cooperate with market surveillance authorities, right? If a market surveillance authority reaches out to you asking questions, you have to reply and you have to be in a dialogue with them. And finally, the reporting obligations would also apply to you, but only to the extent that you as a steward are involved in the development of, of the product, right? I mean, in many cases, the stewards, they are not writing any of the code. And in that case, they may not even be aware of actively exploited vulnerabilities. And if that's the case, they would also not need to report. Yeah? Same goes for the incidents. They may not be involved at all in, in uh, they may not have any IT infrastructure that is relevant to the security of the product, but they may well, very well have such infrastructure. Yeah, If all the repositories are hosted on the server of the steward, then of course there is a, a supply chain security risk, and then you would also need to reports incidents to, to your infrastructure. Now, uh, this was basically a brief overview of the open source elements in the CRA. And now just to close uh, the presentation, a little, um, maybe a bit of an explanation about our timeline. Um, so the CRA negotiations, they have concluded in uh, December last year. Um, you know that there have been European elections in the EU in June. That has all a little bit delayed the process of finalizing the CRA. In the meantime, we have done a lawyer linguist revision of the text. So the text um, that you, um, the latest version of the text uh, that is available, it's the version of the parliament, right? I mean, it's, it's good enough. Uh, nothing has really changed, but some minor language tweaks have been done and um, there will be a final version of the text that will look slightly differently. After the summer, the parliament and the council, they will again confirm this corrected version, and then it can enter into force. Uh, it will be published in the official journal of the EU, and it can enter into force towards the end of the year. Um, that kicks off officially the three-year transition period, right? So um, manufacturers or stewards, they will only have to be compliant with the, three, with the CRA in three years' time, so basically roughly at the end of 2027. And in the meantime, during those three years, of course, we have our work cut out for ourselves. So we have to publish the standardization request so that the European standardization organizations can start their work. This is going to happen really soon. I cannot give you a precise date, but uh, we are working hard to make sure that the, we can publish the standardization request after the summer and before the end of the year. Uh, secondly, the Commission, of course, has to provide some guidance so that all the stakeholders concerned by the CRA can implement the CRA more easily. Um, we also have to provide uh, some definitions for the important and critical products that are listed in the Annex. As I said, they're explicitly listed in the Annex, but there are currently no legal definitions in the CRA, and the Commission has been tasked to provide those legal definitions. Um, we have just run actually a stakeholder consultation. We've had in individual stakeholder sessions for each um, type of product. And we are now moving towards uh, drafting the definitions. There will be another round of consultations on the website of the commission where you can provide a written feedback to draft definitions that we're going to publish. And we're also hoping to finalize this work really quickly because we know that the definitions will be important for the standards. I mean, this, we are going to request product-specific standards for all the important and critical products that are listed in the annex. And of course, it's helpful for the um, standardizers if they know exactly what the scope of those products will be. Yes, and finally, we, are, we have to, I mean, when I say we, I mean uh, the cybersecurity agency, ENISA. ENISA will have to set up the single reporting platform to enable the reporting of manufacturers and stewards and this platform needs to be ready within 21 months after the entry into force, because then is when the reporting obligations kick in. So they kick in a little bit earlier than the, all the other obligations, which only kick in after 36 months. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and the, our goal is that basically everything that you need, all the guidance, all the standards, is ready within um, two years into the transition period so that there is one full year left for the manufacturers and the stewards to comply with the CRA rules. And that's it from my side. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and uh, would be more than happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Benjamin. There are a lot of questions already. Uh, <laughs> let me... Um, let me see um, if I can stop the sharing. Can I do that easily? Oh, you, you were faster than I. Yeah, I was faster. Uh, <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. Uh, perfect. Okay. So let me start, uh, I think, with a question that just goes really well with the timeline that you were just describing right now. So a lot of people use this link from the same, from uh, uh, Sharon, from the Eclipse Foundation to join the call. So a lot of the questions, I, I don't have the name of the person behind them uh, as a result, but I think this question is going to be uh, a very um, a helpful to you, very interesting to have an answer to. It says, what is an appropriate due diligence during CRA? transition. Uh, machinery has a long integration time. Some are starting today with a contract and going to be put into service placed on the market in 2028. So how can these manufacturers integrate components in this long time frame? Most of the components do not fulfill the CRA requirement as of today. Yeah. Um, so there is no obligation in the CRA to only uh, integrate CRA compliant components into your product. That is not the case now, and that will not be the case after the CRA has entered into force, right? So I mentioned earlier, of course, that um, checking whether a component has a CE marking is a very good, um, it will be a best practice, of course, once the CRA kicks in. So of course, you, you should check if the, the component that you integrate is CRA compliant, but there is absolutely no obligation to only integrate CRA compliant components. And that won't that wouldn't even make sense because there will always be on components that are not even subject to the CRA, right? I mean, if you integrate a component um, that is has been built as a hobby, but um, that is nonetheless very mature and uh, that has a good security posture, why not integrate it? Integrate it, right? Just because it hasn't been placed on the market as a product doesn't mean that you cannot use it. So the due diligence really means that you have to look at. Um, the risks associated with your own product and the environment in which your product will be deployed. And based on those risks, you have to take, you have to decide how far you take that due diligence obligation, right? I mean, you can, of course, say I only limit myself to integrating components that have the CE marking, but there's absolutely no obligation to do that. There are other ways to do due diligence, right? You can, for instance, check the change log of a component just to see, do I get, will I get regular updates in the future? Is this component really actively maintained? Are there a lot of maintainers in the repo, right? Or you run some tests, yeah? I mean, you can run uh, some uh, static or dynamic code analysis. So there are, there are a myriad of ways of doing the due diligence and certainly you are not obliged to only integrate components that carry the CE marking. Thank you. I think there's a follow-up question that kind of ties into this, uh, which is uh, from Joshua Conard <laughs> Ho, uh, and asks, are there any requirements for tracking that end-to-end -end supply chain? And, and I think you were kind of answering this uh, to some degree, but I think it, it is it is getting sort of what exactly are the requirements for doing that when you're doing the kind of due diligence that you were just describing. Yes, I mean, indeed, you have to keep track of the components that you integrate into your own product. There's even an explicit obligation in the CRA to, to generate an S-bomb. So if you're a manufacturer, you have to create an S-bomb for your uh, product. You do not have to publish that S-bomb. Uh, there's no obligation to make it public, although I would consider it best practice to publish it. But you have to keep it at your disposal for your own internal processes, because s bonds of course, also help you keep track of the components that you have in your product and makes it easier to check uh, your product against um, well-known um, vulnerability databases and so forth. And you also have to make the s bomb available to market surveillance authorities should they ask for it. All right, wonderful. That's, that's very useful. Um, shifting a little bit. Um... Gerardo uh, Lisboa asks where uh, he can find a legal definition for um, uh, commercial activity in the broad sense and monetizing. 
Yeah, um, so there is no explicit definition, uh, there's no explicit legal definition in the in the CRA, but as I said, we are tapping into an existing framework, right, and we are tapping into the framework of EU product legislation. This framework is called new legislative framework, so it has traditionally been used for safety, and we're using all that terminology, manufacturers, importers, distributors, placing a product on the market, making a product available on the market. I mean, all these definitions, all these terms, we recycle them from this existing framework. And uh, by and large, the definitions that this framework provides and the, well, the case law and all that also applies to the Cyber Resilience Act. There is actually a special guide. Um, let me just find the link for you. It's called the Blue Guide. And this is a horizontal um, guidance document that uh, provides uh, manufacturers and basically anyone else who is interested, of course, um, in explanations how to interpret the rules of the new legislative framework. Now, of course, we know, I, I just put it in the in the link, uh, the chat. Now, um, <laughs> though I'm not sure if everyone can see it because it says me to hosts and panelists. So maybe- Yeah, let me, let me, let me- Ah, everyone, sorry, thing. let me share, share it again. So now it should work. Okay, so here you have the link to the blue guide. You're more than welcome to take a look. Now, of course, we know that when we talk about hardware and software products, these are not ordinary products, yeah? So not everything in the blue guide uh, can be applied to software in the same way, right? I mean, the question of placing on the market for software, for instance, is slightly different because we're not talking about individual product items as we do with other physical products. And um, the CRA, uh, in addition to some of ex some definitions that you find in the definitions article of the CRA, the CRA also provides for a lot of recitals. Uh, these recitals, they also have legal value. And in these recitals, a lot of examples are given regarding the open source. What does it mean to place a product on the market? What is monetization? Uh, what is the broader commercial activity and so forth? Wonderful. I think those uh, that link and those comments are very helpful. And then make sure to to add those also in our in our references in our GitLab, um, because those those questions come up fairly often. And um, yeah, I didn't have like uh, you know sort of like clear pointers to answer them. So thank you very much for this. To also add, All as right. I said uh, earlier, we are going to provide guidance, right? So um, please let us know if the documents that already exist. Do not are not sufficient from your perspective to provide you with the legal certainty that you need. Then we will help you with the guidance. Okay, well, thank you for that offering too. That's very helpful. Um, staying in the same, well, I think you kind of addressed this, but I'm, I'm gonna ask the question anyway. But Marta, which says, who will decide if a legal person is a manufacturer or open source steward? And then as a follow-up, can there be multiple open source stewards for the same project? I didn't Ooh, understand an interesting one. question. Sorry, can you say no, that? So let me ask, yeah, there are two questions. Absolutely. Let me ask the first question again. Uh, the first is, who will decide if a legal person is a manufacturer or an open source steward? I mean, you decide, but you, you're of course not free to pick as you please, but you decide by looking into the law and then making uh, then making the right decision, right? You look into the law, you see, uh, you check the requirements for these types of actors and whichever one you meet, and then this is who you are basically, right? And um, to answer the second question, yeah, it's absolutely possible that multiple um, entities um, are the steward for us, are a steward for the same project. It's also possible, by the way, that you, uh, as a manufacturer, for instance, are also a steward. So you could be a manufacturer for one product and a steward for another project. So you can wear multiple Wait, but hats. You can wear multiple hats, but I, I assume that as a, a simple uh, as the same legal entity cannot wear multiple hats for the same projects, correct? If you're a manufacturer, yes, you're not. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Let's see. Um, uh, let's see. As, the, as they're all marked with the same name, it's harder for me to walk my, my okay. way through. Um, well, so, you know, there's a lot of questions about like specific definitions. Um, and one of them asks, could you expand a little on the term intended for commercial use? For open source software, is this meant that FOSS maintainers are expected to explicitly state that their component project is from now on. 
So uh, essentially, how how do you def like uh, if can do you need to state on your project what the intended use is uh, and and if so, you know, is this sort of like default assumption that it's one or the other? Um, like, yeah, what makes it that it's intended for commercial use? Yeah, no, you only have to spell out the intended use or as we call it intended purpose of the product if it's a product that is placed on the market by a manufacturer. Only in that context, there is an obligation to uh, specify the intended purpose of the product. So for open source components, there is no obligation to do that. Um, a commercial activity, I mean, a commercial activity exists when uh, the project has been created for commercial purposes, right? So if you create the project really just as a hobby because you want to learn programming and then it just grows into something bigger, but there is never any intention to for it to be commercialized, then it's not a commercial project. If, for instance, a couple of manufacturers come together and they say, we all have the same needs here. Yeah? So we let's build a component together because we need this component for all our products. Then there's obviously a commercial uh, nature because there is an intention by the developers, by the people they contribute to that project to later put it into a, a product that will be monetized. Um, so following on that question, um, uh, it is asked if uh, ex if I developed example, a software and use a certain library or something, um, wait, let me just, let me just figure out exactly because this is a follow-up question. Um, If I if uh if I develop a software and use a certain library, um, after my development is done, and, uh, and I think the person is asking like if they're reliable down the line. Let's say that you build software like an open source library now, um, and then it picks up and gets like used in commercial uh, activities, but you're uh, you don't have anything to do with this. Does that make you reliable? So um, the Cyber Resilience Act as such does not establish liability in any way on anyone, right? So um, whether you are subject to the CRA or not has in principle no influence on whether you are liable or not. The CRA merely establishes obligations vis-a-vis, -vis, well, the public or vis-a-vis, -vis, yeah, I mean, you just have to be compliant with the CRA. And of course, there is the market surveillance. So market surveillance can come in and check manufacturers products and uh, take measures if these products are not deemed compliant, including fines. So you may have to pay a fine if your product is not compliant. But that's, of course, not a question of liability. That's just a question of breach of the obligations of the Cyber Resilience Act. There is a separate liability regime at EU level, which has been negotiated at a, at a similar time as the CRA. That is the Product Liability Directive. Uh, but I cannot answer questions about the product liability directive because I'm simply not an expert on it. Yeah. Great, that's the PLD, uh, yeah. correct? Yeah. Um, uh, I, I think that so you know in in um, in the community in the open source community, I, I think people are uh, tend to use the term "be reliable" in terms of like, am I supposed to comply to something? In yeah, that, in a, yeah, in yeah. A, you know, in a strict, in a more strict sort of like legal sense. And so, I, I guess the question is, um, you know, could be reframed as, do I have legal obligations if I build a library uh, and I'm sort of like the owner and maintainer of a library, and then someone else comes in and commercializes it? Um, and I'm assuming that the answer to that from the uh, uh, graph that you shared before is no. Is yeah, that exactly. is my assumption yeah, correct? correct? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much uh, for this answer too. Um, I'm going to mark those as answered. There's a question in the chat about sharing the slides. Yeah, absolutely no problem. Wonderful. Yeah, I think that's going to be very helpful. I found those slides um, uh, very helpful to sort of better understand your perspective. Um, well, the commission's perspective uh, uh, on, on, you know, how the CRA fits and, and what exactly it's trying to achieve um, that uh, tends to uh, be easier to lose track of in like the 300 pages of the CRA uh, when you're not used to looking at legislation like this. Yeah.
Uh, so I think those are very helpful for this. Um, uh, Stefan asks if you will provide better definitions and use case for remote data processing. Um, the answer is yes, basically. Uh, so the remote data processing is a maybe a bit of an unconventional element in the Cyber Resilience Act, right? Because other EU legislation, product legislation doesn't have this terminology. So it's basically something new that we are introducing to product legislation. And we've received a lot of questions about it. In particular, what is the boundary? Yeah. So where does the remote data processing solution stop? And the rest of the company starts, right? Because when you run something as a service, of course, it's always somehow connected to everything else in your company. And the CRA is, of course, not um, a framework that regulates the way that companies are organized, right? It's really just about the security of the product. There are There is some language in the CRA in the recitals that uh, clarifies this. But we, we are receiving a lot of questions about the remote data processing and we'll definitely provide more guidance on it too. Wonderful, thank you. I, I'm hearing um, the idea that recitals clarify a lot of things in, in um, articles, on, uh, you know, like a couple of times in, in this conversation already. Um, is there a good way for people to uh, figure out which recitals clarify what a bit of the regulation itself uh, outside of like being very familiar with everything? Yeah, I mean, it's true. There is no mapping, basically, of an article against a recital, but they they are they follow the same chronological order, right? So, yeah. Okay, so the, the idea is basically you you if like you're in around Article Seventeen, let's say this is like in the around the first third of like the the recital, yeah, exactly. roughly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Wonderful. This is also and something the, the that the working group, I, I believe, could help usually, with. The recitals usually also um, pick up the language that is used in the article, and then you can basically see very clearly which recital belongs, in a sense, to which article. Yeah. yeah. All right. Wonderful. Uh, yeah, I, I think like this is one of the exercises that the working group could do. Actually, is is have some kind of like better mapping, mm -hmm. uh, create some kind of mapping between the two. I, I think this would be helpful for for a lot of us. Um, okay, um, I have a question here uh, about uh, open source package distribution um, ecosystem mm -hmm. um, um, and about the role of the organizations who sort of manage those um, uh, uh, distributions, uh, like uh, 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 distributions like Debian or Arch Linux or FreeBSD. Um, and are they considered as distributors or importers or manufacturers or open source stewards uh, with regard to this area? Like, what? How exactly do they fit? If they're, um, uh, what what exactly is their role? We're talking about Linux. The question is right. Yeah, pack. Yes. Yeah. Um, are the packages package managers employed by Linux distributions? Um. So, are we talking no, about? So, uh, APD we're talking like about that? the no. We're talking about the projects um, themselves. Um, yeah. Uh, the projects who are packing together uh, a distribution, right? So, um, right. Uh, they're uh, themselves a combination of um, other projects, um, and there yeah. are um, uh, they end up being um, sort of directly available. Um, and would they be considered distributors or importers um, with regard yeah, to so the CRA? Or The fact that there are distributors in the CRA and that uh, Linux products are called distribution, yeah, that's kind of coincidental. So that does not mean that Linux distributions are distributors. Um, so yeah, it depends on the Linux distribution, right? So there is no, uh, not just one answer. If that Linux distribution is monetized as a product, then it would be considered a product in the CRA and would be then the, the entity uh, that is assembling the distribution would be considered a manufacturer and all the core obligations would apply. But there could also be, of course, a case where a Linux distribution uh, would basically uh, not be directly monetized. And then uh, the entity behind it could perhaps be considered a steward. So it depends. It's a case by case uh, question, right? You would need to look into the legal text. I cannot give you uh, legal advice. I can tell you that distribution is a manufacturer, that distribution is not. 
because I may be wrong and then, <laughs> then I get into trouble. Um, so it depends, it's a case by case question. Uh, and the question of them being importers, uh, is that something that's been uh, uh, brought up? Because it's a question I've heard asked a few times. No, I mean, the importers are really companies uh, that um, that place a product on the union market, a product that has been developed outside the union, right? I mean, the way it often works is that a manufacturer, let's say there is a manufacturer based in the US, yeah, um, they may just place their product directly on the EU market as a manufacturer. But in some cases, uh, what happens is that there is a company in between and that company does the placing on the market on behalf uh, of that manufacturer in the third country. And that would then be considered a, an, an importer. Yeah. All right, thanks for that precision. Um, I'm looking at, um, oh, that's a really interesting question here, um, which asks um, to what, extent does the trademark status of an open source project affect which legal entities can receive the CE mark for that project? Uh, so this is an important question in the open source ecosystem um, because one of the differentiators between the open source project and the potential product um, in some cases can be literally, like the only difference can literally be the ownership of the trademark of the product mm -hmm. Um, and so uh, essentially, um, I, I think the question here is asking um, uh, if you're putting, a, if you're turning a project uh, X into a product on the market, but actually don't own the trademark for the upstream, uh, can you still make it, make it a product with a different trademark, obviously, right? So... Uh, you know, let's say that there was a project um, uh, um, for, like, I'm just thinking out loud here, like I'm Ruby on Rails, right? Uh, and there's a trademark and the trademark belongs to someone. And then you're putting it on the market and you're calling it like, I don't know, something different. Um, um, uh, like, is, would the trademark ownership affect your ability to do that at all? So the, the CRA does not change the way that trademark law works, right? It has no impact on that. So if you are allowed to take that component uh, and integrate it into your own product, the CRA will not stand in your way. And then you can, of course, if you monetize that new product, you can, of course, uh, if it's compliant with the CRA, uh, fix the CE mark. All right. Yeah, that's very helpful. Um, perfect. Um, there's a follow-up question to the question about uh, the package distribution ecosystem, um, um, where the person says the projects are not always commercial, right? So for example, uh, Debian is volunteer-based and Ubuntu is not. Um, and so um, what would um, a non-commercial status be? Would would that, like that, that who are, um, packaging software like this, would that make them um, um, a, a steward in that sense or? Yeah, I mean, as I said, I cannot give legal advice on individual projects that would be very Fair difficult. Um, but as in general, I mean, uh, if, 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 this distrib if the distribution exists because a group of people of volunteers come together to build something for ultimate commercial purposes, yeah, then there is a wider commercial nature. Yeah? And then you could be considered a steward. Thank you, that's helpful. Um, so let me again uh, clean up the list here. Uh, there's um, a question from Thomas Freck who asks, um, with copyright topics, we had the question, what distribution would mean for larger corp corporations? Um, as far as I know, even distributing to another department triggers the distribution requirements. Um, so uh, Tobias is, is referring to copyright law where uh, when you look at open source licenses, distributing to another department within the uh, your own organization uh, can trigger distribution requirements. 
Um, does this also, uh, essentially, is this also the case for placing on the market? So let's say that you're providing a service internally to a different branch of your company. Uh, does doing this place it on the market? I would I would say no. I mean, I I think that can be a tricky legal question. So I think it depends probably uh, on how this uh, company is organized. But simply providing um, a piece of software to another division in your own organization would definitely not be considered a placing on the market because there is no market, right? Um, mar market means market. Yeah, you have to place it on the market. For instance, to make it available for sale, and there must be a a form of monetization somewhere. If that is not the case, then it's not being placed on the market. Yeah. But I mean, it, it can of course become complicated with subsidiaries that are maybe partially owned by you or someone else. And there I would actually refrain from answering the question because I'm not certain enough about the answer. Yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah, um, uh, uh, fair enough. Um, and I think, um, Oh, that's a very specific question. Uh, it says, Adam, as a manufacturer, you have to provide a distinct support period. Is this support period for software calculated on the minor version or the mainer version? Um, so um, I don't know if you can even answer that question or how you would want to address it. Uh, but but I think um, no, it, I it's a... Oh, please, go ahead. Yeah, uh, so the CRA does not um, have the, does not use this terminology of minor versions and major versions, but it, it has something somewhat comparable. Uh, we have the concept of substantial modification. Yeah, so if um, a modification uh, has an impact on the risk profile of the product, then it would be considered a substantial modification. And a substantial modification is uh, considered a new placing on the market of that product. So when you uh, make a, a feature update to your product, that is not just a minor fix, right? I mean, if you if you do if you don't just change the color of the interface, for instance, or add additional emojis, uh, if it's really a feature update, um, then it would be considered a new product with digital elements, and uh, the clock for the security update provision starts ticking afresh. All right, wonderful. That um, that term um, that you just use, substantial modification, is that right? Like, yeah. um, uh, uh, how, how like uh, how is this like is this defined somewhere? Is this part of the guidance that you yes, would be working uh, on? Yes, it is or? defined. I mean, there are explanations in the in the blue guide. There are explanations in the recitals, and we will also provide additional guidance on that because it's of course a very important concept that is quite key to to the CRA. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much. I think that we have caught up was all of the questions. Um, is um is this so? Like at the top of the hour, as does everyone, anyone else have a question uh, left to ask for Benjamin, um, on uh, today? I'm gonna give this like a, a, a few seconds more. Uh, so I'm hearing, no, I'm good. Um, um, there is another one here. Oh, did I did I miss the question about the CE mark? Um, I, did I did I um, answer? Did I mark has answered a question that I shouldn't have? Um, yes. So, oh, here's another one. Yeah. <laughs> can I have, so there's a question. Can we contact Benjamin for more questions individually? Um, I mean, yes, you can always reach out to us. We are available for uh, to answer questions. We can always set up a call, right? It's more difficult for us to answer questions in writing at this stage, but we can set up calls. So yes, there, uh, there is an, I invite you to reach out, of course. Um, we cannot always um, have bilaterals with every single individual because we are also time constrained. So we actually like formats such as this one because it allows us to reach a wider audience and answer questions that, uh, I mean, you know, we always get the same questions, basically. I mean, I know all the questions by heart by now because we always get the same questions. 
So for us, of course, it's very efficient to have information sessions like this one. But if you have a very particular question and uh, this kind of question would not be appropriate for such a session, you're more than happy to reach out, of course. You're more than welcome to reach out, of course. Yeah. Okay, so if you have a few more minutes, I, there's a couple more questions that popped. Benjamin, I, I, I know that, I, I don't know what your, uh, um, would like a, another question, another couple of questions be fine or do you have to of run? Of course, yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Okay, wonderful. Uh, so um, I'm hearing why are audio and sonar transmissions excluded? Um, example uh, to radio, so I don't know what TX, uh, oh, in contrast to radio TX, and I'm sorry, I actually don't know what radio TX is. I'm not sure I understand the question, to be honest. So why are audio and sonar transmissions excluded, I guess is the question. Uh, I mean, what does it mean they are excluded? Uh, so are we now, if we, I don't know what we're talking about now. If we're talking about the question of scope, whether my product is in the scope or not, the question is, is this product directly or indirectly connectable? Yeah. So, and of course, an audio connection in particular, a digit, I mean, if it's a digital audio connection, that could be considered a data connection. Um, so, yeah, if my product comes with a digital uh, the digital audio interface, then and that is the only interface that that product has, I think that would be considered a data connection in the sense of the CRA. Yeah, and uh, digit if if my if from when we now let if we don't talk about the scope but rather about the essential requirements, of course the essential requirements would also apply. To, to a digital audio interface. You would also need to ensure that this digital audio interface is not an attack vector for my product. Okay, so I'm not sure if this answers the question because yeah. I'm not sure I understand the question myself either. Uh, so Tobias, if you wanna be sort of like, uh, 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 maybe a little uh, more specific or sort of like reframe the question, I think that would be very useful. Um, um, and, uh, you know, for uh, answering all of those questions. Um, thank you, everyone uh, who joined uh, today uh, for joining us. Uh, we're having, um, uh, let me just share my screen here. Um, uh, we have a, a session coming up next week. Uh, which will be on uh, the standards making. Um, and so understanding uh, the, the key standards and their production timeline and how they fit in um, the timeline that Benjamin was sharing at the end of his deck earlier today. Um, we'll be sharing our uh, this deck and, and, and Benjamin's deck um, on, on the list as, as soon as possible. Uh, there's a recording of this video, uh, which will go up as, as soon as we can. Um, and, you know, in the meantime, um, there's a mailing list uh, that uh, you can join to, um, to um, discuss in the working group. We have office hours uh, every Tuesday at 4 p.m. and we'll be uh, having weekly call calls uh, very soon. Uh, we work on GitLab, um, and there is a CRA-focused repository, all in linked from um, the deck here. Um, and we're preparing sort of a, an information hub, which will collect, uh, in, uh, you know, webinars such as this one, um, and some of the informations that uh, were shared today. Um, so, you know, thank you very much, Benjamin. Thank you again for joining us today. Um, and we're looking forward to see you all uh, next week. Um, uh, so, um, thank you again. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for having me and have a nice day.